Daily life for the first generations of wage earners in New York City. A classroom summary of the book, How the Other Half Lives by Jacob Rice, which was published in 1890. Additional details of work and life are taken from the book Five Points by Tyler and Binder, told using illustrations from the books by Rice. In the year 1740, the population of New York City was 10,000 persons, but 2,000 of us were enslaved. The city occupied land only from the eastern coast to what would become Central Park. Everywhere else was forested. Hidley says that the small area that would later house the tenements of Five Points area was under a 15 yard or 15 meter deep lake that was two miles or three kilometers around. The outlet connecting the lake and the Hudson River later became Canal Street and a path that was used to take cows to the lake later became Little Walter Street and then Mission Place. In New England around the year 1800 90 percent of us were farmers working our own land living mostly off our own crops and exchanging daily assistance with neighbors. Only 10 percent of people were artisans and shopkeepers and these often had a live-in apprentice. There were almost no employed or unemployed persons. In fact, the first factories had trouble finding employees. Farmers exchanged goods through the barter system and had little money to purchase goods made in the first factories. Beginning in the 1820s, there was a rapid expansion of commercial activities in the U.S as people began buying and selling everything for profit. The number of factories and workshops grew with the number of employee customers who worked in one factory or in its warehousing, distribution, and retail sales and used their wages to purchase goods made by other factories and workshops. To obtain profit, business owners had to pay wages to their own employees who then purchased goods from other business owners. The greater the wages of the employee customers, the greater would have been their purchases and hence the income of the business owners. But each owner worried that purchases would occur at someone else's factory and so kept wages at their own factory as well as possible, though this curtailed their own income. In society as a whole, wages and purchases rise and fall together. In 1845, the New York Daily Tribune published a series of reports on the low wages and poor working conditions of those of us who worked in the small-scale sewing shops of New York City. Sewing work was mostly done by hand, and often in rooms that were so hot that everyone was sweating. The reporter George Foster labeled and described the sweatshops of the textile industry just 25 years after the Lowell Mills were built. Those with better paying jobs bought clothes, strolled the avenues to be seen and to see, became volunteer firefighters, had casual evenings dancing and drinking, and went to the theater, which was more interactive than occurs today. The audience interrupted the actors by shouting comments, and the actors would comment to the audience. For example, an actor would turn to the crowd to say, Don't you boys? And this would make the audience cheer. The audience most enjoyed portrayals of themselves. The Grand Duke's Opera House was entirely conducted by boys. Through the years 1820 to 1900, about 100,000 immigrants per decade moved into New York City to work in workshops, warehouses, and retail stores and such. It took several decades for us to learn the hard way how to safely house one million persons in a single city. Reese explains that in the year 1800, a person might rent a spare room in a large home or in the guest house behind the main house. 
These so-called boarders paid for room and meals, which were eaten with the homeowner. A couple decades later, so-called lodgers paid for a room, but did not receive food. This new arrangement was a source of income for house owners. As urban rent numbers grew, homeowners added two or three floors to the guest house, regardless of the strength of the foundation, and divided the space into a greater number of smaller rooms. Floors were also added to the main house, and the basement that used to house a pig was now divided into smaller rooms that could each be rented. Wooden tenement buildings of two or three floors began to be built as business investments. And Binder says that each floor had four apartments, which were two room flats. The larger room was 12 feet by 12 feet, 4 meters by 4 meters, and the smaller sleeping room was 8 feet by 10 feet, for a total of 225 square feet, 21 square meters. In the poorest Five Points neighborhood, the average flat held five persons, but one in six had eight or more persons. Reese says that some flat held 12 to 20 persons of all ages and had no privacy. The room might have two beds, but no tables or chairs, and people would sleep shoulder to shoulder on the floor. A pile of rags might serve as a bed. And Minder says that the average room was crowded, but some rooms held just two parents and one child. As an example of the worst crowding, one tenement had 179 persons in 15 rooms. Typically, rent was $8 per month in nine suburbs, or $7 per month in five points, but workers had to live near their workplaces. Rent was 25% to 50% of income, so many renters took in one or more lodgers. About 17% of five-point residents were boarders in someone else's room. In the 1850s, the wooden buildings were being replaced with brick buildings that had four to six stories. The buildings had no elevators, and only the outer rooms received sunlight and fresh air. Stairways were built steep so that they would waste little of the rentable space. Stairs were unlit. While carrying coal, food, and buckets of water, renters had to grope their way up the stairways that were so dark that you couldn't recognize faces as you passed the other people. Many persons fell and were injured, but no laws yet existed to hold the landlord accountable. Ann Bonner says that renters had some dishware and toys and were not all as bad off as reported in the press. But every tenement had a few persons who resorted to prostitution. One survey interviewed some 2,000 prostitutes to ask why they had to resort to prostitution. Ann Bonner says that tenement rooms let in the rain and snow and that basements flooded with water that leaked in through the roof. Residents burned coal in a stove to cook and stay warm. The poorest families resorted to burning furniture to survive the coldest nights, but neighbors would intervene before anyone froze to death. The tenements were full of vice and humanity. The inner courtyard was full of mud and garbage in the outhouse, which was not maintained and was not connected to city sewers, but it flooded into the basement on rainy days. The windows facing the courtyard could not be opened due to the chuckling bad smell of the outhouse. Despite the smell, residents had to sort to using the outhouse, and some resorted to keeping a chamber pot in their crowded room. In 1857, only one quarter of the city had sewer lines. Raw sewage was everywhere. In 1865, the Six Ward Sanitation Inspector declared 585 of 609 tenements to be unsanitary. Street gutters were also full of mud, garbage, and human waste. Visitors complained of the revolting smell. Streets were cleaned only by pigs until 1830, when New York City created a street cleaning department 
But trash was simply piled into the street gutters, awaiting eventual pickup, which did not become weekly until 1865. Mud and trash from the streets got on clothing and shoes and was tracked into every building. Rugs were shook from windows above you and your laundry line. Only half of tenement rooms had a laundry line, and it was above the smelly courtyard. Some people dried clothing on the rooftop. Tenement crowding caused chloria and other epidemics to occur and kill as many as one in five renters, plus one or two building owners or managers. Mourners placed a white badge at their doorway. This death would occur in one square block while a neighboring area had no illness. Death was as concentrated as happens in a tornado. Such epidemics resulted in creation of the New York City Department of Health, which still exists today, and in the Tenement Housing Act of 1867, whose implementation was delayed by two years due to another epidemic. When the tenement building caught fire, residents of the upper floors could only hope to jump to neighboring buildings. So a law was passed requiring fire escapes, this new law also required ventilation shafts, toilets, and windows. The 1879 Act further required that windows face outdoors, not an interior hallway. Landlords considered the air shaft to be a waste of rentable space, so there were only one yard or meter in width. The Act of 1901 required that courtyards be built in place of tiny air shafts. Five Points had dozens of flop houses, which rented sleeping space in a bunk for three cents per night, one dollar per month, or on the floor for one third that price. Typically, two persons shared a bunk. About five percent of New York City residents slept in basements, but half of those persons lived in Five Points. Basements had no air or light, and the musty smell got into clothing and people. Some salons rented cots near the back wall where persons could pay to sleep even through customers filled the salon. Tenement owners told their building managers to collect rent in advance and evict if it was not paid. They did not care about the comfort or safety of the renter. They cared only for profit. They typically made 15% to 30% profit, but hoped to make 100% profit. Reformers complained that rent in Five Points was almost as high as rent was in nice neighborhoods, and stated that this proved the greed of landlords. They also said that lower rents and slightly higher wages would reduce tenement crowding caused by the need to take in lodgers. Other persons said that business should do as it wants without any interruption by government laws. The residents in Five Points said that they only needed more work than their average of 200 days per year. One person said that the tenements should be torn down and replaced with the post office and other government buildings because those would raise land values in the area. This was actually done some 50 years later. Often, little maintenance was done to the tenement buildings. Wood was allowed to rot, ceilings would hang, and mold would grow. Some building owners leased the entire building to one wholesaler who would gouge individual renters. The buildings were noisy because walls were thin and every room door was left open in an attempt to promote the circulation of air. Tenement buildings ran out of water due to the hot summer months. It took some decades for us to learn to put water storage tanks on rooftops. When the summertime temperature was 95 degrees Fahrenheit, 35 degrees Celsius, outside, 
the temperature in the stale air of the inner rooms of the tenement was 115 degrees Fahrenheit, 45 degrees Celsius, and this killed our babies. Family members watched helplessly as an infant gasped for air. Determined moms would carry infants on daybreak walks, hoping to make a cooling one. It was common to take wind excursions, on land or by boat. New York City hired 50 summer doctors who visited 16,000 families per year to give advice on how to cool babies. About 10% of families could not afford a funeral, so their deceased loved ones were buried for free in the city cemetery. Little coffins were stacked high and taken to the cemetery, where infants were buried in groups of 12. After sleeping shoulder to shoulder in the tenement rooms, dead adults were stacked three high and shoulder to shoulder in long trenches at the free cemetery. Each week, a typical family might earn $6, but pay $2 for rent and pay about $1 for bread, $1 for milk, $0.30 cents for butter, and $1 for 8 pounds of meat. They also bought coffee, potatoes, and pickles. Cheap milk was watered down and sometimes had contaminants that killed children. When this occurred, the manufacturer paid a fine of $150 to the sanitation department. Reese accompanied a doctor who visited the tenement home of a man no longer able to work due to lead poisoning received on the job. The mother and one child had a contagious eye disease that had gone untreated. The family lived on $2 per week and a few loaves of bread plus a piece of corned beef sent to them on Saturdays by a priest and nuns. This family watched the infant child die of starvation. When the departing doctor gave money to the family for food, the parents brought ginger ale meant to ease the suffering of the infant who sadly died the night. While making a house call in 1849, one Boston doctor found 39 persons living in a flooded cellar. The patient was lying on a plank placed between two stools, and there was a dead infant sailing around the room in its coffin. One man worked in the sewers until the poisonous gases ruined his health, decreasing his abilities and caused him to lose his job. He then fell into an insane depression. Corton reports that in the year 1890, out of about 10 million employees, there were 35,000 accidental deaths on the job. Between the years 1855 and 1907, individual states passed Employer Liability Acts involving injuries on the job. These evolved from medical tort laws. An injured worker could sue an employer for negligence and demand compensation. Beginning in the year 1902, states created workers' compensation insurance plans that employees could purchase. The insurance would more readily but partially compensate injured workers if they agree not to sue in court for negligence and full payment. In 1884, the Bureau of Labor was created in the Department of Interior. In the year 2015, this bureau reported that about 3% of U.S. workers were injured and 5,000 persons died on the job, which is a rate of 35,000 per 10 million workers. In 1970, the Occupational Safety and Health Act was created to improve the safety of workers. In the clothing manufacturing industry, the small-scale employer, who Foster described as the sweatshop operator, hired a handful of employees to fill an order for a few hundred to a few thousand items. The item might be a shirt, but not its buttons or holes, or it might just be the buttons and holes, or maybe the entire shirt. The sweatshop owner might rent a room or two or a hallway in the tenement building, own a handful of sewing machines, rent two others, and sometimes to make 50% profit on a clothing order. A husband and wife team might earn more money but also sewing along with their employees and obtain a profit of $30 per month. 
The hired family might take cloth home to work in the tenement room where they live. The room might be ankle deep in cloth debris. Every family member over the age of 10 or so would work 12 to 16 hours per day in the home, seven days per week. This did not leave time for parents to learn English or for their children to attend school. It typically took one or two generations for immigrants to learn English. New York City contained a mix of languages that changed with every city block. By the year 1890, child labor laws had been passed to outlaw employees from hiring children under age 16 to work in a factory unless the child was literate and no children under age 14 could be hired. But New York City had just one labor law inspector for all of its factories. Child workers were told to lie that they were over age 14. No proof of age yet existed. The child labor laws applied only to factory, not to the tenement sweatshop or wager work done in the home. Laws also limited the factory workday to 10 hours, which had to end by 9 p.m., and required a 45-minute dinner break. While Prussia and other European nations began passing comprehensive child labor laws in the year 1839, the U.S. did not until 1939. Rees says that the most evil landlord, sweatshop owner, employed the same people who rented his tenement rooms. He paid his tenement employees just barely enough to keep them from revolting. Told them that they would lose both their job and their home if they complained, and sometimes would evict numerous families in mass. Some decades later, laws would be made that forbid eviction without due cause. Reese says that this landlord did not let his humanity curtail his profit. The renter employees were tied to the building, almost as peasant serfs were tied to the village landlord. By the way, some immigrants arrived from Eastern Europe, which had just recently ended serfdom around the year 1850. A brand new invention was to require new renters to pay a so-called key deposit equal to half a month's rent. A key was needed to enter a flat, but building entrances had no lock. A cloak maker was paid 75 cents per cloak, which retailed for $8. One cloak maker bragged of earning $12 per week by working seven days a week until midnight. One Bowery firm sold 15,000 suits per year and $1.95 each and at a cost of $1.13 each. A good profit was 15% of gross sales, but one firm printed and sold lottery tickets that had no drawings or winners. A girl might be paid $2 per week in wages to be a cashier, ringing up $1,100 per week in sales. Her boss would fine her $0.60 cents for little mistakes, such as sitting down in the chair that a recent law required to be placed there for her use. The owner of the company and the supervisor might split $3,000 per year in such fines. One particular husband and wife team made cigars in their tenement room. The husband had been a blacksmith back in the old country, but could not find that type of work because he did not speak English. By the way, here is a list of chemicals added to today's cigarettes. He made 3,000 cigars per week, worked from dawn to dusk, and were paid 11.25 for those 3,000 cigars. They could work 17 hours per day in summer light, but only 12 hours per day during winter. Tobacco workers soon became used to the odor released by this fermented plant. A law was made to ban cigar making from tenement rooms, but the courts stuck down that law as unconstitutional. Smiths and Masons and such who moved from the slavery of the South were not allowed to work in these industries within New York City. Rice was surprised that white oppression still occurred two generations after the end of the Civil War.
Former slaves were allowed to rent flats in only the worst tenements and only under the condition that no building repairs would ever be made. The boundaries between black and white neighborhoods were lined with so-called black and tans, which were bars that had a mixed crowd. Jim Lowe combined shuffle with Irish dance to create tap dance. Former slaves held contests for aristocratic walks. The prize of a sugared and frosted cake was given to the winner of these so-called cake walks. Former slaves enjoyed owning pianos and went on to invent cakewalk music, then ragtime, and then jazz and blues music. The character of human beings is such that we say, oppress us and we will make music. Louis Armstrong is the greatest American because of the revolution he created in music, including the solo. Dr. Martin Luther King is a great hero because he fought injustice. George Washington had only to fight armies. In the first few decades of society-wide capitalism in the U.S., where we switched from working the family farm to working in industry, family income was so low that children were abandoned in disturbing numbers. This terrible characteristic of our economic system required the formation of the Children's Aid Society in 1853, just 33 years after the Lowell girls began working in New England factories. By 1890, the Children's Aid Society had sheltered some 300,000 outcasts, homeless or orphaned children, and sent 70,000 children into adopted homes in the West. This society still exists today to give needy children a family life. The Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children was also founded in 1853 and still exists today. Between the year 1875 and 1890, it helped 14,000 children per year and helped to convict 1,600 adults per year of abuse or neglect. Children grew up in homes of wearisome toil. In the year 1890, there were 1.5 million persons in New York City, including 45,000 infants, 160,000 children under age of 5, and 450,000 children under age 15, including 15,000 who lived in the asylums and institutions of New York City. These two societies and the asylum helped 38,000 children per year, where help ranged from a bed for the night to a hospital room or an adopted family. This number is 8% as large as the 450,000 total number of New York City children. Why did our children need help? because the wages of their parents were too low. Wages were so low that tenement renters would burn wooden structures for heat and would remove and sell metal fixtures, as still occurs today. The official U.S. estimate in 1890 counts 360,000 poor out of 1.5 million persons in New York City. Rice titled his book, The Other Half. Wages were so low that 10% of New Yorkers had to ask for assistance from charities. One doctor said that in nine years of practice, he knew only one tenement family who had obtained permanent improvement. One woman explained that we get so downhearted that we just have to go where something is going on or we just can't stand it. Rice also said that Pampers were bankrupt in hope, money, courage, and purpose. A person who has no hope might see suicide as the only way to end the constant daily misery. Persons who attempt suicide were sent to the insane asylum. There, they were chained together while taken on a daily exercise walk. In 1889, some 1,400 persons were sent to the insane asylum. Older persons were no longer nimble enough to keep jobs and might die homeless in the streets. Others died in almshouses, which is an old folks' home that was run by a charity. A city or country might operate a poorhouse where elderly and disabled persons would live and work. In 1935, the U.S. Social Security Act began the process that would lead to a retirement system for workers so that they would no longer starve and die in the streets after becoming too old to work. One in four babies died before reaching age one. Three companies sold baby insurance. They charged from $0.05 cents to $0.25 cents per week and paid $17 if the baby died. 
There were thousands of homeless children who huddled together to sleep in the warmth of exhaust vents, sandboxes, in the pipes of old boilers, or just inside the doorway of any unlocked building. Beat cops shooed them on as they encountered them. In the year 1889, the Children's Aid Society housed 12,000 boys and girls by operating five lodges for boys and one for girls. The society also operated 21 industrial schools, two reading rooms, a cottage for disabled girls, a brush factory that employed disabled boys, and a school for typing, dressmaking, and laundry. Some 4,000 children attended these each day. The homeless child had a slim chance of becoming an artisan. Children were put out onto the street by parents who could no longer afford them. One child was found with a note that read, Take care of Johnny. For God's sakes, I cannot. Throughout history, children have been abandoned at the doorstep of the wealthy by parents who hoped that the life of their child would be better in his or new home. On each summer night in New York City, a few children were abandoned at doorsteps, but nearly all of them were taken straight to the police and then onto an asylum. One boy, who was dressed in a simple rag, began singing when he got his first bed to sleep in and was given breakfast of a whole egg and three slices of bread. He hadn't gone to school, lived off of bread crusts, and had been sleeping in a pile of hay on a barroom floor. Abandoned infants were always taken to a hospital, but 80% to 90% of them soon died because they were too far gone to recover. In the year 1889, 72 dead babies were picked up in the streets of New York City, and another 448 abandoned children died in New York hospitals. The Foundling Asylum of the Sisters of Charity opened in 1869 and still exists today because they said all children deserve the right to grow up in a loving and stable environment. Throughout a 21-year period, the sisters took in 1,000 babies. The asylum had left a cradle outside its doors, but it filled up so fast that it was moved just inside the door. No questions were asked when a mother dropped off her child, but the sisters did ask to breastfeed her own baby and one other before leaving. In the year 1889, 460 mothers nursed before leaving. Some 1,100 tenement mothers were paid by institutions to nurse abandoned babies and to love and raise them to age four or five when they would be tearfully adopted by a new family out west. To receive monthly pay, these temporary mothers were required to bring in the child on the first Wednesday of each month. There was a monthly spectacle of caring mothers amidst the new and inhuman economic systems that demonstrated cared for profit over the well-being of children. Profit was increased by paying wages below the level needed for subsistence. Rice said that the tenement renterer labored to make the most of a scant opportunity, working throughout a lifetime just for food, rent, and clothing, and had no time for heart or mind. Rice asked if it was a life worth living, but we can still be certain that each family shared loving kindness for a few hours per day. Low wages meant great profit for a few business persons, but at the price of a lifelong misery for too many children and families. Low wages created a society that few persons desired. The increasingly harsh economic life for some of us meant an increasing amount of crime in the city, mostly in the low wage areas. In response, the less affected businesses in higher wage areas called for the creation of a police force. Unfortunately, we came up with the unimaginative solution of using police forces to fight low wages poor living conditions, and the small hopes for the future. Our mutual efforts can do better for all of us. As businesses saved on wages, taxes had to be collected from all citizens to create their first ever police force and to expand court systems. In 1889, the citizens of New York City paid $7 million on its police force, $2.3 on its asylums, and $0.4 million on its courts. This amounted to $9 per adult citizen per year. The Five Points area had some manufacturing that paid better wages, but the owners of these businesses would not hire residents of Five Points, nor recent immigrants.
Signs would actually say, no iris need apply. Day laborers worked in construction digging foundations and sewer lines carried brick and stone, laid cobblestone streets, and loaded and unloaded hundreds of ships per week. It was a handmade world. Even the Brooklyn Bridge was built by hand between the years 1869 and 1883. Day laborers typically got work four days per week, less in winter. No work was available for day laborers when the weather was too cold or rainy. People who worked sewing with needles by hand could find only 25% as much work during the winter. So parents might resort to sending their children to beg in the streets. Day laborers suffered frequent injuries as loads fell, unfinished walls fell, and people fell from heights. Injured people, sick persons, and other older persons had no income. About 10% of workers purchased insurance from the Laborers Union Association, which charged $2 to join plus 12 cents per month, and paid $2 per week when sick or $15 for a burial. We would have to wait another 50 years before governmental systems would be created to regulate work-related injury, sick leave, and social security. Typically, work was available only 200 days per year for day laborers. Throughout the last 5,000 years of civilization, 90% of us worked or owned farmland. Only 10% of us were artisans, and very few of us worked for wages and shops. So unemployment could involve very few of us. In the few first decades after the invention of the factory, it was new things have half of the population working for wages and becoming unemployed with the frequent downturns of the economy. During the frequent recessions, day laborers obtained work only one or two days per week. Many day laborers and female servants became the stoop street beggars. Soup kitchen lines would double in length. One mission fed 900 families per day. Clothing sales, production, and employment would drop to nearly nothing. Each morning, unemployed mothers would be heard in shops begging for work and offering to receive one half or one quarter pay. People who worked in the sewing industry had no financial reserves and were the first to be penniless. Ann Binder says that laborers' life was hard, dangerous, and financially precarious. Some immigrants would return to their home country where they would grow their own food and gather burnable peat to keep on. During the recession of 1837, many of the urban unemployed came close to starving. During this recession, eight states defaulted on loans from the European banks. Horace Greeley later advised the unemployed to go west. This recession was caused by the overproduction that caused many prices to drop by as much as 50%, but also by the flood of bank-issued paper money. The doubling of the price of flour in 1837 resulted in New Yorkers looting flour stores. We began to see the relations between prices inventory levels, money supplies, inflation rates, unemployment levels, consumer spending, and the quality of life of the workforce. These things are often discussed in today's daily news. Economic relationships and cycles quickly became more complicated and pronounced as industrial production, employment, and consumer purchases began to involve a larger portion of the population. Economic slowdowns resulted in workers losing their jobs, and those unemployed persons had no money to purchase goods, and this led to further reductions in factory orders. Newspapers described lives of misery, degradation, and wretchedness that lasted until a person starved moved to an insane asylum, or died. One widow sewed 12 hours per day to earn a dollar per week, took in three boarders to pay most of her rent, slept on the floor with her children, and sometime had only bread and molasses to eat and a piece of meat on Sundays. <laughs>
Author Salone Robinson sold 50,000 copies of a book describing the lives of poor, young New Yorkers. People cared about children and donated to charities which existed to make up for the low wages paid by inhuman employers of parents. Few residents of Five Points ever managed to earn enough money to open their own business. Sewing and shoemaking paid little for very hard work. Employers took advantage of newly arriving immigrants who had to accept any work they could find. The employer might charge a deposit equal to one week's wage on cloth that his employees took to work in their tenement home and then made some threat of keeping the deposit. Half of Five Points women worked in the sewing industries. In the year 1855, immigrants accounted for 96% of New York City's 12,600 tailors and 6,700 shoemakers and 90% of glazers who walked through the streets shouting, Windows put in. One quarter of Five Points women worked as low-wage household servants in more wealthy homes as we saw occurred in medieval Hanzhou, China. Servants were on call 24 hours per day and were given a day off only on every other Sunday. Servants were given a bed in an attic or closet and were paid as little as were the sweatshop sewers but received room and board, though some commuted to work. Many employers treated servant girls terribly, demanding respect obedience, and humility. A servant might be fired for being sick. Peddlers were on every street and street corner selling anything and everything, including buttons, thread, fiddle strings, suspenders, pocketbooks, jewelry, buttermilk, straw for bedding, fruit, fish, and clams and such. Some peddlers bought and sold the clothing of recently deceased persons. Streets were everywhere filled with shouts of hot corn by girls peddling during the season. Girls also carried brooms around to sweep dirt or snow away from streets in front of pedestrians who might tip them. A girl might receive $2 per day in bad weather, but only 25 cents during good weather. Girls also peddled flowers. If a grown woman worked as a peddler, she would receive angry glares. Boys worked as shoe shiners, who were called boot blackers. Boys also sold newspapers along the streets. They paid up front for the papers from the printer or from a wholesaler and could not return unsold papers, so they quickly scanned the day's headlines to estimate sales. Illiterate boys asked a friend to read the headlines. Headlines about disasters sold the most papers. Streets were filled with sound as boys shouted headlines. Boys would also call out the news that he thought might interest the pedestrian who was walking past. Each day they sold a morning newspaper and then an afternoon newspaper. Boys earned one quarter dollar on slow days, but as much as three dollars on days of the most dramatic news. Boys also peddled matches. Most boys and girls who were peddlers lived at home, but some were homeless. The children of single mothers were likely to be street peddlers. By the year 1890, the population of New York City was 1.5 million persons, and 1.2 million of them were living in 37,000 tenements. Official estimates in 1892 numbered the poor of New York City at 360,000 persons out of 1.5 million persons, which is one quarter of the population. But in the title of his book, Rice estimated that half of us had too little work and wages. Half of us were paid little to sew fancy clothes for the half of us who were paid enough to buy them. Higher wages for the sewers would have doubled the sales of clothing. Every big city today that has too little work and wages has streets filled with children peddling any and everything and working for pennies. <laughs>
Rice thought that the tenement system had become a permanent aspect of life, where today we would call for government to pass and enforce laws. Rice said that the reputation of New York City required decent housing for all as a matter of duty. It didn't occur to him that government could regulate wages or limit the cruelty of the economic system, but he thought that tenement life would improve if laws would make it unprofitable to operate overcrowded and dilapidated tenements. He stated that some new buildings in the upscale side of town contained single-family dwellings of two to four rooms, which were being called apartments, that had windows, fresh air, laundry lines, and owners who settled for 5% in profit. Rice concluded that, to improve tenement life, the philanthropy of the assistant societies was needed and that the tenement owners should settle for a profit of 5%. Such was the condition of capitalism just three generations after the low girls began working in the new factories of New England. Life was very different for the worried journeyer than for the village farmer of New England. Just 50 years before Rice described tenement life in 1890, rich and poor homes were distinguished merely by the number of candles that were lit at night. By 1850, city residents were confronted by an increased contrast between wealthy and poor persons. The average Boston merchant left $5,000 in land and property to heirs when wages were $183 per year. Poverty, disease, and illiteracy became more concentrated and apparent, and an increasing number of persons were enduring poor living conditions. As the portion of us who became wage earners rather than farmers continued to grow, there were discussions back in the farming villages about some of us factory owners taking unfair advantage of laborers by decreasing wages. As early as 1827, some of us were publicly condemning the greed of some business persons. In his book, Industrializing America, Walter Lick says that this caused some of us to question the very foundations of capitalism. Such injustice has occurred since the first cities of ancient Mesopotamia, but it had never before involved such a large portion of the population being employed as wage earners. By the year 1899, the gap between rich and poor had grown such that the top 1% of our population, which was 125,000 families, owned 51% of our nation's assets and had an average worth of $260,000, while the 5.5 million families of the lower 44%, including most village farmers and all tenement renters, owned just 1.2% of all wealth and had an average of $150 in property. The J.P. Morgan interest alone held 341 directorships in 112 corporations with a total capitalization of $22 billion, which was three times the assessed value of all real and personal property in New England. The widest gap in wealth occurred in 1929 as the wealthiest 1% owned about 50% of the property. That value decreased to 30% from the 1940s through 1980s but then rose again to 40% in 2012. In 2015, the top 10% of us receive half of all total income, while the lower 20% receive just 3%. What is the appropriate division of wages and wealth among a population? Who is to make these important decisions? All of us together. John Buchner explains that within a few decades of the arrival of the Industrial Revolution, there was a general resentment among the population of the U.S. to the injustice of the readily visible and widening gap in wealth between poor and rich. The social legislation that occurred around the year 1900 was one response to growing inequality. This required the government to take on new responsibilities for the first time ever. Labor strikes were another response. 
Labor disputes became murderous little wars over stable wages and profits. Beginning in the 1880s, there were a large number of violent labor strikes, many of which resulted in the deaths of workers and militia. During the 1890s, there were 1,300 strikes per year, and these involved up to 3% of the entire workforce, or 500,000 persons, and up to 30,000 businesses. During the years 1877 through 1900, troops were used 500 times to quell labor unrest, and this showed that our corporate leaders had access to government police and were determined to suppress strikes at all cost. It is hard to imagine that some people are killed over their own wage and job. It is hard to imagine that some of us enrich ourselves by stealing the very lives or at least the well-being of other human beings, but it is the demonstrated nature of some business owners and executives. Recent reports show that some business owners and executives have little empathy for other human beings. When one business leader, John, tries to increase profits by decreasing wages, then all other business owners should complain that this will reduce their sales and profits because John's employees will have less money to spend. John tells his employees that if they give him 66 hours per week, he'll allow them 4 hours per day for their families. And in exchange, he'll pay them almost enough to pay rent and buy food and cause 1% of them to abandon half their children. Rather than just being comfortable, John can become very rich through the extra and unnecessary misery of employees. Rather than donate my lifetime to enrich John, some of us employees prefer the family life of gather hunters, canella, and New England farmers. Most strikes lasted 15 to 30 days and began after announced changes in the rules regarding work assignments, discipline, or layoffs. Workers would generally strike because they felt that their livelihoods were being threatened by the arbitrary decisions of bosses. Strikes occurred as owner practices exceeded the wage earners' endurance for precarious lives and uncertain futures. About half the strikes were over wages. Others involved calls for shorter hours, controls on hiring, or union recognition. About 10% were sympathy strikes. The workers won in 40% of strikes, lost in 39%, and compromised 14% of the time. In the end, these strikes resulted in an overall increase in wages. The strikes were held to decide whether the security of our corporate owners and operators through sufficiently healthy profits was more important than the security of workers' lives through regularly occurring paychecks that were larger than the minimal amount needed to just barely cover rent and to buy bread. Lick says that the first generation of us workers to encounter the large corporation were challenging the growing political and economic power of concentrated capital and its threat to democracy. Workers fought injustice when they had believed it to have crossed a line. This was the reaction of the U.S. labor force to the economic injustice that accompanied the development of mass business. Striking workers had the support of community members who would take to the streets to show their support and arrest records show that the supporters came from all walks of life. The target of the community uprisings was the property of the corporation. Other local workers would often strike in sympathy. Local shopkeepers often extended credit to strikers, and local newspapers often blasted the governmental officials for being unfair. Since local militias frequently sided with strikers, the local political authorities often had to request more distant militia, whose arrival might cause an escalation of violence. The strikes were a grassroots phenomenon prompted by resentment of economic injustices and anger about hard times and the emergence of the giant and uncontrollable corporation. Organized labor played a smaller role in the upheaval because half the strikes did not involve a formal union. Just 2% of the strikes involved railroads, 10% involved co-workers, 
10% involve clothing workers, and 26% involve construction workers. As the price of products rose during the 1860s, the number of union members increased because workers wanted corresponding increases in wages. In 1886, Samuel Gompers created the American Federation of Labor and became the chief spokesman for labor until he died in 1924. Lick says that Gompers challenged the capitalists head on while Eugene Victor Debs challenged the capitalistic system. There were many protests to switch from 12 to 8 hour work days. In one such protest, on May 1, 1886, about 200,000 persons walked off the job in both large and small towns across the country. Workers said that the shorter work day would give a well-earned rest, but also time to be human, to pursue education, and to fulfill civic duty. For example, some said that they could not vote because they had neither time nor energy after finishing work. By the way, you might like to examine Oregon's vote-by-mail system, which produces an 80% voter turnout rather than the 55% national average. Lick states that the railroad worker strike of 1877 began a few weeks after the executives of each of the major railroads simultaneously announced a 10% pay cut. Many persons thought this was an example of the worst of our executives' backroom deals. In Martinsburg, West Virginia, the railroad workers of the b and Railroad refused to handle the trains or even to let them pass through town. The president of the b and Railroad persuaded the governor of West Virginia to send in the state militia. These with which the corporate executive gained access to the levers of power, including the governor's agreement to use the threat of deadly force, made many workers wonder if the U.S. was a nation that stood for the corporate executive's profits or for the general well-being of all of its people. How would you handle this situation? The troops who first arrived in Martinsburg were on the side of the workers, but a fight did erupt and a striking worker was killed. This ignited a nationwide strike that spread to workers of other railroad companies and other businesses too. The entire B&O Railroad was shut down. Protesters then gathered at the B&O office in Baltimore. In the resulting riot, 10 of us protesters were killed, 16 were injured, and 250 were arrested in fights with police. The governor of Maryland asked the President of the United States to send federal forces to help restore order in what was the first use of federal forces to suppress labor unrest. Strikers in Pittsburgh were blocking all trains, so the local militia was called in. When they refused to take up their post, the militia from more distant cities were summoned in what the strikers viewed to be an invasion. As a train load of those troops arrived, they opened fire on the blocking strikers, killing 20 and wounding 70. Word of this massacre brought the entire town into the streets to attack the militia, loot stores, and set fire to nearly all railroad property. After three days of fighting, 40 persons were killed and 104 locomotives and 2,000 railroad cars were destroyed. Few railroad buildings were left standing. At Cyrus McCormick's Reaper plant in Chicago, a rally was broken up by police who killed four persons. That night, 2,500 persons met in Chicago's Haymarket Square to protest these killings. A bomb exploded in the midst of us police, killing eight, so we in turn shot eight persons dead and wounded 50 others. This battle reverberated throughout the country. Three days of rioting in Chicago left 18 persons dead. The railroad strike spread into a general strike as many workers from many trades struck in sympathy. This strike involved other towns, including San Francisco and St. Louis. The strike lasted for two weeks and halted much of the nation's commerce. This strike cost the railroad some $30 million and resulted in lost wages for workers. Many workers lost their job as they returned to work. In the end, thousands were jailed, hundreds were wounded, 
and 50 persons lost their life because the owners and executives of the nation's major railroads simultaneously announced a 10% pay cut for railroad workers. In Chapter 18, we will see that whenever a cost saving is envisioned, it often occurs that the suggesting executive receives a portion of that saving as a bonus. When the steelworkers of Homestead, Pennsylvania went on strike in 1892, the company's owners and executives instructed the factory guards to build fortifications. They also hired 300 extra guards. As these new guards first arrived, they were attacked by striking workers. Nine workers and seven guards were killed. The state militia arrived to restore order and to enable the managers to hire non-union replacement workers. The union strike was broken after three months. Full production was again resumed but with fewer union workers. The people of Homestead were bitter for decades. George Pullman had a manufacturing plant located in Chicago in which sleeping and dining cars were built for sale to railroad companies. He built lodging for his employees south of town but charged high rent. Lick describes how in June 1894, Pullman announced a reduction in wages in response to the 1893 recession. When the announcement caused his employees to strike, he in turn closed down the plant and threatened to evict his lodgers. This strike quickly spread to once again shut down the nation's railroad system. The strike ended when federal troops killed 25 persons and wounded 60 others. Pullman then reopened his plant with new employees. Throughout these wage wars, some business owners and executives called for the police and military to shoot to kill. One executive said that the strikers should be given a rifle diet for a few days and see how they like that kind of bread. To these business persons, the month's profit was more important than the lives and miseries of other non-persons who dared to become inconvenient. This clash between workers and business owners came within the first 60 years of our shift from being family farmers to wage-earning consumers. When an employer uses power to mistreat workers, an individual worker can hardly fight back, so workers organize into unions to balance the power. In the 1890s, only 10% of workers were members of a labor union. In the 1950s, one-third of workers were union members. To avoid the balance of power between unionized workers and business owners, many owners and their political assistants continue to draft laws today that attempt to restrict union membership, even for government employees. In 2016, only 6% of private sector workers are union members, but one-third of U.S. government employees still belong to a union. The national wage peaked in 1973 and has decreased 15% since then. As union membership and wages decrease, corporate profits increase, and this is the income of the wealthiest of us. Workers struggled worldwide for 100 years, which is four generations, to obtain the 40-hour work week. It did not become law in the U.S. until 1937, though this law affected only 20% of workers initially. Without unions, employers might still require employees to work 66 hours per week. By the way, workers in France today have a 35-hour work week so that they have more time to spend raising children which is a priority in life for human beings and for our mutual society and civilization, but not for the robber barons. Licht explains that many of those of us having legendary wealth often got that way by never being jailed for pseudo-legal tactics and by never considering the ill effects of our rapacious activities. For example, Jay Gould once tried to gain control of the entire gold supply of the nation through massive buying and by spreading rumors that he was acting on behalf of the U.S. government. He was never jailed for this action, though it jeopardized the nation's economy. He also illegally flooded the market with Erie Railroad stock and was forced to flee the state of New York. Gold managed to bribe a New Jersey legislator into passing a new law 
allowing him to hold the Erie stock within New Jersey. Rockefeller's Standard Oil Company began in Cleveland, Ohio. He grew to dominate his market by buying out as many competitors as possible, including 50 companies in Cleveland and 80 in Pittsburgh during the years 1865 to 68 alone. Standard Oil bought crude oil and then refined it into kerosene to sell to customers who burned it in their home for lighting. The owners of oil processing plants were already dumping waste products such as gasoline into nearby streams. No other human beings wanted their water supply to be polluted in this way, but the owner of the oil plant saved a few pennies. Within a hundred years, polluted rivers were actually catching on fire. The Cuyahoga River in Cleveland caught on fire 13 times. Starting in the 1960s, government passed laws, raised money, fined polluters, and has spent the last 50 years cleaning up the polluted rivers. Scientists and engineers would be thrilled to build factories, homes, and vehicles that emit nothing into the environment and do not gamble with global death. The owners of manufacturing plants still prefer to save pennies. For example, automobiles need only to be equipped with exhaust tanks. By 1878, Rockefeller held 80% of the nation's refineries within a single holding company whose purpose was to act as a cooperating group in purchases and sales. The holding group would tell a small crude oil supplier that they will purchase 80 percent of its crude oil but at a reduced price. The next year they again offer to purchase 80 percent of that supplier's crude oil but at an even lower price than the previous year. This holding company was so large that it could forcibly lower the price at which it purchased crude oil forcibly lower the price that paid the railroads to transport its refined oil to the market, and forcibly raise the price that customers paid, leaving an increased profit for the owners and shareholders. Legally, this Ohio company could not own the stocks of other companies, especially those in other states, or even tell those other companies what to do. In 1890, the Sherman Antitrust Law was passed to outlaw corporate combinations, such as Rockefeller's holding company, that monopolized and restrained trade. Licht explains that in response, Rockefeller dissolved the holding company but reorganized into several companies chartered in different states, but with interlocking directorships and a key set of executives who maintained control over the whole. In 1899, Rockefeller managed to get a law passed in New Jersey allowing him to control all the companies from within a single New Jersey holding company. This is an early example of the way in which multi-regional corporations outmaneuver local governments' legislative attempts to keep them from unfairly controlling their market. Rockefeller also learned to use philanthropy for public relations. But in 1911, the United States Supreme Court ruled that Standard Oil was an illegal monopoly designed to reduce competition. Sometimes the owners of large companies who each made the same product would agree on territories in which each had sole right to market that product. With no competition in the territory, each owner could raise prices. While business leaders were talking of laissez-faire, saying that government should leave them to act on their own to compete, they were instead forming secret agreements to reduce competition, divide territories, and raise prices to obtain maximum profit for themselves. We often hear of capitalism being the competition of the free market, but competition is the main thing that business hopes to avoid so that prices and profits can be raised. Already by the year 1900, large companies operated across state lines and so could not be governed by a single state. Individual state governments left things in limbo and no federal laws were passed to control the collusive actions of the owners of some companies. Big business has always been decades ahead of our government's attempt to govern them. Today, big business is global while government is not at all.
The Sherman Antitrust Law was enacted in 1890 to fight this practice of secret price-fixing agreements. Antitrust meant anti-price fixing. <laughs>